मोनिका मैम जैसे ही स्टार्ट करेंगी यस नाउ इट इज लाइव मोनिका मैम यू कैन स्टार्ट शुड आई स्टार्ट ओके यू कैन स्टार्ट um is sir going to uh, switch on his video yes sir sir i'm starting okay go ahead good afternoon everyone miranda house and ramanujan college welcomes you all to the day 10 of the faculty development program chemistry the catalyst for change we welcome our first keynote speaker professor mangala sundar krishnan Professor Mangala Sundar Krishnan is professor and head department of chemistry IIT Madras he specializes in the area of theoretical molecular and magnetic resonance spectroscopies quantum chemistry and quantum information he obtained his phd in theoretical chemistry from mcgill university montreal canada in 1988 and completed his postdoctoral research from university of British Columbia Vancouver and University of Montreal Canada he has worked as a visiting faculty Magdal University before returning to India as a faculty member at IIT Madras he has also served as a scientific officer C at Bhabha Atomic Research Center Mumbai professor mangla is one of the founder coordinators of the national program on technology enhanced learning and pitel project of the ministry of human resource development government of india and has been associated with it since 2001 he is also the chief coordinator dtx swayam prabha he is the recipient of several prestigious awards commendable contribution to digital initiatives presented by shri pranab mukherjee honorable president of india in 2017 eminent visitor research university of western sydney australia in 2012 jcpds award international center for diffraction data pennsylvania usa to name a few professor mangala has published extensively in journals of international repute and supervised the research work of many phd students the title of his talk today is a few general principles behind computational methods with applications from computational thermochemistry of cyclic paraffinylenes so the zoom is all yours thank you thank you very much thank you very much for the invitation and also for the kind words some of the awards were obviously not mine i think that there was some uh, small changes in them but anyway i am a theoretician and uh, i work on also educational uh, development online with both government of india as well as private academic agencies as much as i can we present program is a faculty development program and uh, it is obviously directed to teachers and probably postgraduate students i do not know but i'm sure whoever is looking at on the youtube on the basic ideas that some of us use and uh, benefit from in uh, the application of quantum mechanics to chemistry the atomic theories and also computational chemistry but bulk of my talk will be on a system that i have been studying and i shall illustrate some elementary uh, methods to begin with and then go directly to the applications so that the gap is something that you will have enough time in the next whatever period to go back and look at the literature and also fill up i do not have a lot of time to discuss multiple aspects of computational chemistry the only one that i am very familiar with however the basic ideas are extremely important okay so before i begin my talk let me see if my screen works i have a writing screen as well and uh, let me see it looks like it looks like it is functioning <laughs> okay so okay yeah okay so let me share my screen okay thank you are you able to see my screen now yes sir and you see a notepad 
Yes, sir. I see that. So, uh, almost all of quantum and uh, the atomic methods start with two fundamental equations in nature. Okay? I will write for a few minutes, but then we will move on to the slides later. Two fundamental equations, but it's actually one equation. Okay, equations. The first one is written in the symbol IH bar, dou psi by dou t is equal to H t psi of t. Okay, this is known obviously to many of you as the time dependent Schrodinger equation. A large number of chemists and physicists, of course, who study the time-dependent phenomena at the atomic level will have the methods, will have studied some of the methods to solve this equation, to approximate the uh, wave function methods and also the Hamiltonian in time, going into special frames of reference called the rotating frames or unitary frames and all these things. Okay? But by and large, for computational chemistry and to study the equilibrium or what is called the static properties of the system, we solve a subset of this equation when the Hamiltonian is independent of time, when H is independent of time, obviously not spectroscopic Hamiltonian, because spectroscopic Hamiltonian has radiation falling on it and radiation is, uh, has a time dependent oscillating or magnetic and electric field. Therefore, it's not a spectroscopic phenomenon, but what is called the molecular Hamiltonian is independent of time. Then a subset of this is basically the H psi. Now that's a different psi, okay? Is equal to E psi. This is what is known as the molecular eigenfunction. And this is known as the molecular Hamiltonian. And uh, Hamiltonian, yes. And these are, this is the eigenvalue or energy. Or energy eigenvalue. Okay. All the methods that we use today, most of the methods at least, used today, non-relativistic uh, domain, use uh, the equation H psi is equal to E psi, which is a time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay. So everything that I wanted to do in the remaining one, one and a half hour lecture is to highlight some of the very elementary principles very quickly and then move on to the problem that I am familiar with. And therefore on that basis, you can also learn, uh, you can also see some of the applications of this. I do use a program once in a while. And uh, I, even though I'm not a very ardent fan of using somebody else's computer program, but in the case of computational chemistry to build a program of your own takes your lifetime or even maybe more than that. And these days with so many collaborative researchers working together on the same problem from different aspects. The programs also get written by multiple people, examined and then compiled and verified and then applied by a larger number of uh, physicists and chemists. These programs tend to have many, many thousands and sometimes millions of lines. And therefore such efforts cannot be replicated in a laboratory or at home or in the office very quickly. Those days are gone, therefore, we may have to use programs which are programs uh, developed by others, but we must understand what they do and we must be able to tinker and tailor it to what we would like to use it for. And therefore that level of competency is needed in order to do computational chemistry. Otherwise, you might use the programs as a black box and as a graphic user interface driven and an output driven, but 
not without much meaning attached to the results that you get. You will have to have a lot of uh, insight to interpret the results if you do not know what the program is doing. So it is a trade-off between doing something very well in a very small domain versus solving a major problem with a lot of details, but we don't know the details. We, we come up with what are called the general uh, principles, and I think those things are there in the whole of computational chemistry. So there are three or four levels at which theoretical chemistry practical problems are solved in theory. The first one is, of course, the ab initio method. That is the method of solving this using the Hamiltonians, using the electrostatic force fields uh, in the molecules due to the electrons and the nuclei, and due to the spin of the electrons, and sometimes also the spin of the nuclei, and then molecular motion, all those things. But these are, uh, all of them have electrostatic uh, or in origin. That's an ab initio method. The other would be the next level is not to use entirely a program based on the elementary and the first principles of the Hamiltonian and the solution, but you introduce some approximations. And the approximations can be semi-empirical. Empirical means obviously you are coming up with some rules, but you do not know the origin and you think that they are generally good. Therefore, empirical methods are also there. And depending on the size of the problem, the computational methods also change from computational chemistry for the small molecules to a very high level of accuracy to computational chemistry in large domains where near classical or even classical methods and Monte Carlo and other types of molecular dynamics methods can also be used to study the problem. So the Theoretical chemistry domain as a whole is all over from the most elementary hydrogen molecule, hydrogen atom, the, the 32, I mean, the 92 uh, elements, which are, uh, you can find most of them in, in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in use today, and you want to study their uh, electronic structure and the compounds form millions and millions of compounds formed small compounds you can do them very accurately on the other hand if you want to study biomolecules polymeric molecules and material science problems the nano uh, fibers nano rods graphenes so many other large systems that you want to study colloidal systems then you have to tweak the equations to adopt to a macroscopic or a semi-macroscopic in what is called the mesoscopic between microscopic at one domain and macroscopic in one domain in, in between the two. These domains are very important, but the separation between these domains uh, is not a very clear cut separation for us to say, I will work here or I will work here or I will work there. It's the borders, the interface between them, which are equally important, okay? So this is the, Preface or what is called the prelude, I will give before I start moving to my lecture. Okay. So, all that we do is after 1926, 95 years ago, when Schrodinger wrote down the equation, we are still solving that equation and we, we still find enormous number of new things. Okay. So, let me go to my lecture and uh, the fundamental principles that I would like to uh, talk about in. So I hope this is okay, clear enough, isn't it? Okay. So that's uh, myself. I'm from the Department of Chemistry at IIT Madras. My uh, interest in particularly quantum chemistry, not the theoretical chemistry. I'm a theoretical chemist. I mean, I, I'm a spectroscopist, theoretical spectroscopist for the last 25, 30 years, uh, including my PhD. But in computational aspects, my interests were raised by two chemical engineering students in IIT Madras when ISRO and Shar Center wanted to solve a problem. They were looking for some inputs. They looked at computational tools for studying uh, very highly excited molecules, which could be used as uh, elements for propellants and then controlled uh, uh, explosives of various kinds. 
when they approached this chemical engineering student from me from our institute lakshman and thought that he would do some of the basic gaussian calculations at that time gaussian was still available at that time but it was a very uh, much more primitive than uh, what it is today it was gaussian 03 if i remember and then his junior ravi khan they both worked with me for a year for their research projects as part of their impact thesis and they were i mean so uh, phenomenal that i got interested in the problem and eventually i had other students a phd student uh, from my group uh, dr mohammad akbar ali he did computational chemistry the para cyclic uh, findelines this this one the, the model systems i would study uh tell you today is they are all developed by him and then currently i have a student who is almost ready to graduate he's about to write um, so raja manikandan both of whom have really driven me and uh, rather forced me to understand some of the computational aspects as as i told you i'm not a uh, bread and butter computational chemist but now slowly i'm trying to understand the methods behind this okay and other people who contributed to my uh, thinking processes or very close colleagues of mine professor sankar raman from the organic chemistry department in iit madras he came up with uh, a requirement to study paras- the cyclic phenylene systems and he, the, the systems were basically identified by him in the early days and then i have my very good uh, chemical kinetics and abinishio here is Uh, Dr. Raj Kumar, with whom Akbar also worked part time, Professor Krishnan has always been a collaborator, uh, distant collaborator, not with me but with many others in the uh, in the region. And Professor Krishnan is our own MSc student uh, many many years ago and a distinguished uh, alumnus of our institute. Krishnan Raghavachari is the most famous theoretical chemist I can think of today, uh, who has understood computational chemistry in all its uh, possible. Uh, ways and he was a student of professor john popel who won the nobel prize for computational chemistry in 1988 then we have a very good uh, very i mean brilliant colleague dr v subramanian in central leather, leather research institute my own student dr amprasad and then there are reviewers who have helped me to study these things and i use a little bit about now of course goes in 16 coupled with some of the functionals okay now these are uh, two of the papers and the proceedings of the last uh, two years ago uh, mr manigandan presented in in norway let me skip this now and go back to the first one okay the first step that one has to be very clear in the electronic structure is of course the first approximation method called the hartree fock method where the molecular wave function of many electrons is written as the product of the one electron wave functions and the whole exercise of solving the schrodinger equation is geared towards getting the best approximation for the one electron wave function once you have the one electron wave function very accurate it is possible for you to combine the one electron wave functions of the n electrons in multiple ways and one of the most important thing is of course to use the antisymmetry nature of the electrons that is the spin of the electron is a half and therefore you have to have a wave function which changes sign when two of the electrons are switched of all their coordinates both spatial and spin but here for example is the wave function for Two electron system. Okay. So, for example, the the phi function that you have is the wave function for one electron, and the psi is the system, the helium atom. This is a two electron system to begin with. And so, what you do is to use a method which was first proposed in the night, right after the Schrodinger equation was uh, proposed within a few years. Hartree, Douglas Hartree, and later uh, Vladimir Fock joined and. came up with this approximate ways of doing which is known as the self consistent field model scf model to calculate 
the one electron wave function, you treat the second electron as providing the electronic background to the whole problem in addition to the nuclear potential. And so what you do is to look at the electron density of that second electron, which is psi star psi, as you know, the absolute square of the wave function gives you the probability of finding the, uh, the system or the electron in within that small region of R2 and R2 plus dr2. So this phi star phi is more directly related to the electron density and the electron distribution. And this probability, so this is like a charge. I mean, overall, if you add all of this, this will give you the total charge. Therefore, this is like the charge probability density divided by the potential. This is like a potential energy due to the second electron on the first electron. And use this potential energy as part of solving the Schrodinger equation, which of course is the starting equation for all of us. So let me again go back to the screen. The solution when you write, when you say H psi is equal to E psi as the method that you solve in theoretical chemistry, the Hamiltonian is of course, the Hamiltonian is a sum of the kinetic energy of the system plus the potential energy of the system. And in the case of helium, of course, it's very simple. You have two electrons and the nucleus, and therefore that is a, the two electrons, E1, E2, if you do this, and R12, and this is R1, this is R2. The R1 to E1, E2, contributes to the potential energy. And therefore, the helium atom problem cannot be separated out into two one electron problems, but the interaction between the two electrons is, is what you need to approximate. To do that, obviously, the effect of the second electron's potential is added to the electron one potential energy. And then you can see in the slide that the effective potential energy of interaction due to the second electron on the electron one is now the electron one potential energy in addition to the electron one's energy of attraction with its own nucleus, the helium nucleus. This is the kinetic energy term with the nucleus of, of, of the electron, sorry, this is the kinetic energy term of the electron. We are in the, uh, the approximation that the nucleus does not really move very much and therefore the nucleus is almost stationary known as a born of the approximation. Those things are taught in physical chemistry often. So the Schrodinger equation is solved for one electron by taking into account the effect of the potential interactions of all other electrons with that one electron. So, and then once you have done that, you solve the one electron equation, H uh, effective, which is the Hamiltonian that you have here, and solve this. Suppose you don't know what the phi is. That's the whole point. You don't know. Not supposed. You don't know the phi. You have to make an approximation. So you start with some reasonable approximation for the phi. Put that phi in here. And you calculate this integral. And put that integral value into this equation, the H1. And use this to solve the Schrodinger equation, either using matrices or using perturbation theory or using variational methods. There are many different methods. You solve that and you obtain an energy as well as the wave function, the precise wave function. The moment you get this wave function, use this one electron wave function with the coordinates of the second electron, put it back again here and recalculate the potential energy. It will be different because this solution is the solution of the whole equation. This was an initial guess. And this guess is used to write down the Hamiltonian and solve and therefore the solution that you get is slightly, hopefully better than your initial approximation. And once you get a better solution, why not use this new solution for the one electron wave function in here and recalculate the potential energy and resolve the Hamiltonian equation. And therefore you get the second one. Therefore this is a cyclic process, keep on doing it. How long can you continue? until you decide that the energy that you arrive at, the one electron energy that you arrive at, has 
reasonably minimum error. So you are solving this in a method known as self-consistent in a uh, iterative form. This is the first principle in the solution of the quantum equations when you take out, uh, when you go to the very first step of how to solve Schrodinger equation for the atoms and molecules. First is the approximation known as the Hockley approximation. So the cyclic process of finding a better and better and better psi, phi continues on until numerically you have reached a very, very, very small error limit. Beyond that, there is no further changes in phi and then you are unnecessarily wasting resources to compute something better than maybe five decimals is all that you are required. There is no necessity to improve on the sixth decimal and seventh decimal and eighth decimal because the error was required only up to the fifth decimal in the energy. Okay, This is the self-consistent process for solving a one electron wave function. Now, of course, that's not enough because that's just the product of the one electron wave function that you can form for the n electrons. You have not seriously included the electron-electron repulsion in the process except as an average. Therefore, the electron correlation, that is the two electron interaction energy has been only taken into account as an energetic average. The correlation between, spatial correlation between the electrons have been taken out. This is known as the famous electron correlation problem. And post hartree fock then using the hartree fock of course, Slater came up with the method of writing this as determinants, and then using the determinantal form, that is the wave function is anti-symmetric. Suppose you have an electron wave function. The n electron wave function should change its sign when two of the electron coordinates are interchanged, any pair, any pair, because they are all identical particles. And with that also you can build it, but then that was the elementary stage. Subsequently, many, many methods, post hartree fock methods uh, were uh, developed by many groups and they all add the electron correlation, namely the interaction between the electrons uh, that you are looking at through some of these methods. Okay? Uh, one is the perturbation theory method known as the molar plus perturbation theory. The other one, which is a very accurate, in fact, exact method known as the configuration interaction and a very highly accurate numerical calculation involving what is known as a coupled clusters where the potentials of the electrons are treated in the form of cluster potentials. Then you have the configuration interaction in the form of quadratic and later there are many composite methods. All these things have over the last 50, 60 years have matured to a point that today when we want to study a system, we look at which of the methods would do best for which systems and therefore we use that, okay? It still is not a solved problem, still we are there. While all of this is being done in the form of solving the Schrodinger equation, there is of course uh, the other method which was developed by Walter Cohn, uh, a physicist, a solid state physicist and a theoretician. And he put the electron density as a primary quantity and derived a theory called the density functional theory. You can see that the orbital wave functions, if you look up to this, this is all symbols, don't worry about it, this is h bar square, okay? h bar square by 2m del 1, this is like the one electron equation that you have here. For all the other electrons contributing to the potential energy to the nucleus, as well as the potential energy to the electrons, plus the, there is a term called the exchange correlation, which was put in to ensure that this equation is solved. This is the wave function and this wave function square summed over all the electrons gives you the total density, okay? The solution of the Schrodinger equation is now turned over to the determination of the electron density and determination of the energy of the system as a function of the electron density and therefore, one needed to know what is known as the exchange correlation term. And the exchange correlation term is searched thoroughly through various methods. And this of course is a great challenge, but this challenge has been solved partly with the help of the experiments. This is the alternate and the much more 
uh, what is called expandable method because the ab initio processes are limited to small number of atoms if you want very, very accurate results. Whereas if you want to study larger systems somewhat reasonably approximately, the DFT seems to be very helpful. Okay. And in the DFT, to study these exchange correlation terms, electron exchange correlation terms, uh, methods have been proposed by various theoreticians. And the most famous, among the most famous of them is the method proposed by Axel Becky in 1990s, Becky had a series of very beautiful papers on the determination as well as on the thermochemistry associated with the uh, computational processes. And he created what is called the hybrid, the hybrid exchange correlation function is a linear combination of the Hotley-Fock functional, that is the energy that we get, and other terms. And these are some of the terms are more Mathematical, you don't need to worry about them. But Becky came up with what is known as a correction. And today it is known uh, because of the collaborations that Becky had with Lee and uh, Young and uh, Parr. This is known as the Becky uh, three parameter functional. There are three parameters, A0, AX, and AC. And the parameters are obtained also with the help of uh, experimental, very, very accurate experimental data, and there is a potential form which people use. It's an approximate method, but still, it's a very, very good approximation to study a large number of small molecules extremely well. And then this has been formally parameterized also by others and different ways of looking at the parameters known as Purdue and Wang method functionals. These functionals are all now part and parcel of the density functional theory to calculate by the use of some experimental cells, propose values for parameters and then see if these parameters are meaningful in predicting the electron density, predicting the molecular properties, the bond distances, the bond angles, and who will verify all these things? Spectroscopists, of course, for small molecules, the most accurate data are known from spectroscopy and therefore, you can use spectroscopic data, you can use thermochemistry data in terms of measured thermochemistry values, the delta H values and so on. And therefore now theoretical chemistry draws a lot of input from very accurately measured and reproducible experimental results. It's not isolated from experiments anymore. The fundamental theory is the solution of the Schrodinger equation in one form as an ab initio, and the ab initio method led to the development of, let me go quickly, yeah, no, sorry, I have gone to the results. Uh, the ab initio methods go to a certain extent, but the ab initio methods today are combined with the density function theory. And therefore, what you see today is a very large numerical programs. One of the most famous programs among uh, these is the Gaussian program, which has both of the ab initio components in terms of wave functions, and the functionals in terms of the exchange correlation of the electrons of the multi-electron system. And these two are very judiciously chosen in order to solve the computational chemistry problem. Okay. This is the background. The background today is that, that these are the two large domain problems and both have very large codes, computer codes, which have been developed by hundreds and hundreds of uh, chemists working together, theoreticians working together and these codes are what many organic chemists use, many inorganic chemists use, many polymeric and material science people use. The only thing is the systems have to be chosen. Uh, the system studied is chosen already and therefore the functionals have to be chosen carefully. And the same thing when it is extended to solid state, it goes to another domain. The whole branch of the solid state uh, computational uh, physics also comes in, but the fundamental principle is the derivation of the, or the determining as accurately as possible the state correlation from the point of view of DFT. From the point of view of average the best wave functions that one can get. Now, what do you mean by the best wave functions? How do we, how do we solve? See, we all know the hydrogen atom problem. We have studied that. Some of you would have also been teaching that. The hydrogen atom problem teaches you the exact solution for the hydrogen atom in the absence of spin and uh, magnetic field. 
We have the exact orbital solutions. The radial functions are known. The angular functions are known. The product of the two gives you what are the s orbitals, p orbitals, and v orbitals, and so on. And use these as the basis to arrive at what are called the s orbitals of the other atoms, the helium atom and sodium atom. And you see the whole of the uh, build-up principle. They are all proximate. There is no s orbital for helium. The s orbital for helium is an approximation. The p orbital for it's a very good approximation. It's a damn good approximation in many ways. You can do that, but s orbital cannot be functionally written down, algebraically written down as we can do it for the hydrogen atom. Only one electron systems can do that because it's a two-body problem. The two-body problem in that case, the Coulombic problem, has the exact solution. The solutions are given by the radial, the polynomials called the log air polynomials, and the angular polynomials called the uh, Legendre polynomials. You can't do that for helium atom. Therefore, you have to use what is known as the perturbation theory. Therefore, what is the general method of perturbation theory? So let me just quickly revive the uh, concepts that you have. Suppose we have something called the basic Hamiltonian for which we know the solutions, psi zero. Yeah. Is equal to E M zero psi M zero. What it means is that say if you take the hydrogen atom as an example, the hydrogen atom example tells you that there is the one s orbital which we call as the psi one zero. Then there is a two s orbital, the two p orbitals which we call as the psi two zero, psi three zero if you wish, and psi four zero and psi five zero because there are three. P orbitals. And then we have the energy here is, of course, uh, E0 is uh, the Rydberg energy, you know, minus what is the energy for the lowest one? E10 is uh, minus HC Rydberg constant by one square. I think you, you'll remember that. N is the principal quantum number. So any EN0, if you do that, it is minus HC or H by N square. Okay. Therefore, you will have many energy eigenvalues and many eigenfunctions, which are already known. Suppose we use a known set of eigenfunctions, and we want to solve a problem which does not contain only H0, but also contains a perturbation. In the case of the electron uh, correlation problem of the two electron system like helium, the electron-electron repulsion may be added here. Okay. Supposing it is small, Supposing the magnitude of H1 and it's perturbing, it is a perturbing term, not a completely devastating term for the protohamatony. It's not of that magnitude that you cannot solve this as a problem add-on, but you have to solve the whole problem. Let's assume that this is a small problem. Then perturbation theory tells you that to get the solution H psi n is equal to E n psi n, if you introduce a small parameter to do the mathematics and later make the parameter physically relevant to the system that you study. Even in spectroscopy related to the dimensions of the molecular properties. If it is something else, if it is a field, the lambda is associated with the field. But lambda is a small theoretical parameter to get the orders of magnitude correctly on correcting the energy eigenvalue from the corresponding eigenvalue. If H1 is zero, this becomes that. If H1 is slightly contributing to the H0, En is changed by a small amount. By what amount? By this amount, namely, psi En, you write, sorry, En. You write as En zero plus a lambda and a first order correction, one. If you wish, yes, there is also a second order correction, E and two. Now you can see the orders can be managed by the lambda, lambda squared, etc. Later on, after you solve all the problems and you've corrected all of them, remove, put lambda is equal to one, and then you, you can add what you want. But the point is, this is a series like this. And likewise, you can write the wave function as psi n zero 
plus a contribution, a small perturbing contribution to the sign in terms of sign m1 plus a lambda square sine m2 and so on. Okay. So perturbation theory tells you how to calculate these, how to calculate these. And I'm sure you remember the general formula for the EM. If you don't, I'll write down the general formula. The general formula for EM, EM that is not the first order, the second order, but the mth order is given by psi n0 h1 psi n m minus 1. Okay. The previous order to which we calculate. And many of you know that the first order correction E in one, all of you know this, that it is the matrix element or the average value of the perturbing potential H1 in the nth uh, zero order. This is called the zero order eigenvalue, and this is called the zero order eigenfunction. Eigenvalue, eigenfunction. eigenfunction. This is for one, and likewise, you can do the second order correction, you can do the third order correction. The molar pleasant perturbation theory that you have is based on similar ideas of perturbation theory. Sorry, I'll go back to the previous one. Where did they go? Hmm. Perturbation theory is one way. The other method is not to worry about perturbation theory, but use the beautiful uh, principle that we all know, uh, which was derived also by contributed by Schrodinger to the whole of uh, atomic uh, chemistry and atomic physics called the variational principle. And the variational principle is a principle for energy minimization, as opposed to the minimization of the action that was there in classical mechanics much longer, much, much earlier. Similar to that, we have a variation principle for the energy. And the variation principle for the energy for by Schrodinger is fairly straightforward to verify, but it's a beautiful concept. All it says is that whatever be the wave function that you approximately write down, if you calculate the ground state, that is the minimum energy of the system is obtained by solving the Schrodinger equation using any approximate wave function, the calculated energy will always be greater than or equal to the minimum energy. This was proved by Schrodinger. So it's also a proof that using simple representations in your computer, in your class in theoretical chemistry, you should be able to verify. The energy that you calculate is always more than the exact ground state energy of the system, always. At the most, if you got the wave function exact by a coincidence, except for that, your energy will always be greater than. Therefore, keep on minimizing the energy as a function of the parameter to the point that there is no further minimization possible within the limits of error then you have reached in your theoretical calculation what is called the minimum energy. So the variational principle is another beautiful principle that people can use. That is not applicable for the other energies, not the first state, excited state energies. Variation principle is very particularly applicable for the ground state potential. And therefore, to get the exact geometry of the system or as accurate as possible, the geometry of the system and the ground state uh, minimum of the energy of the system and so on, one uses variational theorem. And variational theorem is the, a variational method is the other method. Most of the uh, uh, initio as well as the DFT use combinations of both. initio methods, particularly the, the basis function methods, use the variational principle very, very effectively by doing a small basis function calculation and then slightly improving the basis functions from the standard uh, experiment, I mean, standard, uh, what are called the Gaussian functions, by adding corrections to them, by adding linear combinations to them, they are all built up on 
one layer after the other, but they contribute to fundamentally the variational method or the principle that we have in uh, quantum chemistry. Then of course there are the other methods, but let us with this as the basic uh, background, let's see how these things are used to study uh, the real system. Okay, so the rest of my talk will be to give you a little bit about a problem that I have uh, solved for some time. And uh, this was not done by me, it was done by Akbar Ali and uh, very studious student. He's currently in South Korea, he's doing his postdoctoral work as well as being a faculty in one of the universities in South Korea. I think it's the National University, if I remember. He's there and uh, he published uh, this particular piece of work after we had a discussion with my organic chemistry colleague, Professor Sankar Rabat. And he suggested similar systems, but then we decided that we would look at what is called the cyclic polyenes. This, you see, this is the benzene ring connected to other benzene ring through acetylenes. And uh, this is a para connection that you can see. So this is para phenylene acetylenes. Okay. And uh, if you connect them using meta instead of this point, if you use this point, it becomes a meta connected and therefore cyclic metaphenylene acetylenes. This is one example of a system which forms very large rings as you increase the number of benzene rings and the number of acetylene bonds. You see you are getting more and more uh, structure and you can see that the cyclic paraphenylenes and the cyclic uh, meta, you can see that this is the meta connection. You see the six benzene rings with six acetylene bonds form a beautiful equilibrium structure that you would expect from the sp2 and sp3 hybridization. That is the triple bond sp, sp hybridization. The triple bond is of course linear sp hybridization. The bonds are linear, you see that, that they are linear. And then the sp2 bonds are 120 degrees and benzene ring of course, it's all 130 degrees. So you can see that the this is a very, very stable structure. Everything else seems to either bend this or bend the rings to closer, and therefore they are all stressed structures, anything other than this. So our idea was to look at the strain energies that are present in the rings as a function of the increase in the M. M is one means it's a trimer, M is two means it's a tetramer, and so on. So we, let's uh, not worry about the calculations right now, but let us look at the uh, basic idea of what is the, uh, let me just very quickly, so sorry, I have only the results here. Now I want to explain to you a little bit about the method that we used, okay? We used what is known as the, just one second. There's another file in which I have this more explicitly explained. Please give me a minute. I'll bring the other one. Just I need a minute, please. No problem. Please take your time. I have I tried to explain the, the simple chemical picture. I try to explain it slightly better. One moment. Okay, uh, so what we have is this. Yeah, we will use this as a slide. Let me share my screen. Okay, so what you see here is a, a reaction, but it's not how reactions take place. This is a theoretical reaction, okay? What you see here is uh, 
some number, say m equal to, if you put m equal to one, obviously you are going to get three phenyl groups here and three acetylene groups here. Therefore, balancing this means it has to be one half of this molecule. That's what m is equal to m plus two by six essentially means. Now, this reaction is written in such a way that the bonding characteristics that you see here and the bonding characteristics that you see here are very close to each other. This is one example of what we call as a homodesmotic reaction. Homodesmotic reaction. If you go back, I think I mentioned this in very early, uh, just a second. I mentioned this in one of the schemes. No, I seem to have skipped to that. Okay, so let's stay with this uh, simple structure that we have. So what we have is, if you have three here, you have one half of it. So let's assume that M equal to uh, say four. If M is four, of course you have exactly four plus two by six, one. But you see the number of SP3, SP bonds, the number of SP bonds that you have here, one, two, and there are four of these, therefore eight, and then you have nine, 10, 11, 12, okay? And you have exactly the same number here, 11, 12, 11, 12. And the number of sp2 to sp2 bonds are preserved here because the benzene rings are not changed. What is important is the combination, the number of bonds sp, sp2, sp, sp2. So not only the hybridization of the individual atoms are preserved, but also the connectivity between those hybrid bonds, if it is in one SP, one SP, two bond, you see on this side also one, and the, that side also you see one. So these are reactions which are written down in, in theory to ensure that the chemical surroundings are very close, but they are not exactly the same because this is stressed, there is a strain energy here. This doesn't have any strain energy in its equilibrium geometry. Therefore, if you calculate the chemical energy, that is the heat of reaction of the theoretical con I mean, conversion of this compound to this compound. And if you also have a way of locating the experimentally, if possible, the heat of formation of this compound, it is possible for us to calculate the heat of formation of this compound from the heat of reaction and the delta H of this, because the delta H of this is the delta H of this minus the delta H of this, the enthalpy. Delta H, I mean, the enthalpy of the reaction. The enthalpy of formation of this compound minus the enthalpy of formation of this compound is the enthalpy of the reaction. Therefore, if we know one of this experimentally, and if you can calculate the difference between these two energies as accurately as we can, and that is possible if we choose chemically very similar molecules so that the error cancellation is maximum. And given that, the homodesmotic reaction gives us a way of calculating energies of the heat of formation as well as strain energies of molecules, which may not be synthesizable because of very high strain, but we still can study them and we can predict their values. Here is another example of another scheme. The same homodesmotic homo reaction can be done in a slightly different way, written in a different way, namely here, with the M plus two acetylene giving M plus two, this linear compound. So if we have experimental data for these, and we have experimental data for these, then we can in principle calculate the, uh, using computational chemistry, the delta H of the reaction, and then it's possible for us to build the delta H of the species. Now, if we calculate the delta H or the enthalpy of formation of the species for M equal to one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, and then divide the molecular energy by the corresponding M, you will get per monomer energy, which is the, you can see that the way we expand, this is uh, three, this is all para, you can see this is four, this is five, this is six, seven, eight, nine. And for each one of them, we will end up calculating what is called the Delta H of formation of this, delta H of formation of this, 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 etc. And then for each one of them, if we divide this by three, if we divide this by four, if we divide this by five, you get it per monomer. 
and you will see as the ring increases, this number reaches to a certain value. Therefore, you can see what is the lowest value from that. It is possible to calculate the strains of each of these rings from an approximate level of theory. And the theory that we use is, of course, the combination of the ab initio wave function, 631d star is the basis set that we use for the computational chemist. And also the functional that we use is the Wicke Lee Young Power functional method. And the full theoretical detail, of course, it has to be part of a computational chemistry course. But in this lecture, I would like to tell you that similar methods can be devised for many, many compounds. And this is known as generally known as the computational thermochemistry. Okay. So this is all for the paracyclic. So uh, this is 4, 2. This is 4, 3. What is 4, 2? You can see 4, 3, 4, 4 paracyclo compound. This is 4, 5. And 4, 6, you can see that and 4, 7, 4, 3 is this one, 3 phenylenes. And you can see that this is uh, 4 of them, 5 of them, and now it go up to 9. And therefore, you can calculate the strain energy. You see, for the smallest number, the strain energy will be very large. But as you increase the ring size and you as you calculate the heats of formation of these compounds from experimental data as well as from the computational data, you can see that the strain energy per monomer keeps on decreasing to a point that it reaches an average value. So you can see that the strain energies and the heats of formation, both can be calculated from simple reading of the quantum chemistry, out, the computational outputs, and per monomer they decrease as n increases. And the strain energies are obviously lower when compared to the n cyclic paraphenylene acetylenes. The bending is likely more in the case of paraphenylene acetylenes versus the metaphenylene acetylenes. And you can also calculate vibrational energies and vibration frequencies for these things. Same thing with the metacyclic. The nice thing about metacyclic phenylene acetylene is that metacyclic systems have a reference point of a near zero uh, strain energy, which is the six ring. You have seen that already. The six rings. Okay, one, two, three, four. This is zero strain energy. Therefore, we have a reference point. Therefore, if M is less than that, uh, less than four, you have strain. M is greater than four, you have strain. But what happens if M becomes 20 or 25? Does it remain plain? I mean, planar? Does it? It doesn't. There are lots of interesting data when you do simple computational chemistry calculations for large macrocyclic systems. You get lots of surprising results. Let's look at the metacyclic. See, in the case of the metacyclic systems, here are the examples. You can see that, that you start with uh, two cyclic metaphenylene acetylene. This is the reference point for us. So you can write then five, then you have six, then you have seven, you can see that there are different ways of calculating the uh, heats of formation using different ways of writing the, uh, the reactants and the products. But the purpose of choosing these products is that uh, they have experimentally measured and confirmed the delta H of the reaction. And therefore, we have an experimental parameter that can be used to fit in to the theory. Okay. Now, you see, as N increases, See, the rings are no longer uh, very simple. They start bending, they start becoming boat-like, and they twist. And you can see that by the time you go to nine cyclic beta phenylene acetylenes, there are nine phenylenes, phenyl groups here. And you can see that the structure is becoming very difficult to uh, predict. And the generalized homodespotic reactions are, of course, similar to that, what we have already done. And you can... I'm going to talk when I call you later. Thank you. And so you can see that as the n increases from two, three, four, five, six, up to this, everything is okay. Seven, it's all right. By the time you get here, this is what? Three plus three, eight. You see, already bending takes place. And by the time you get to, uh, you also have this as 
the other possibility, the difference between the two is computationally not very large in energy. So you can see that these are two possible controllers. And then you have boats. And then you have two rings coming in. Sorry. You have two rings. Therefore, you see the computational, simply looking at these compounds from a pure elementary approach to dividing the error bars in terms of things that we know, in terms of things that have been measured, and then computing only those that we want to compute, you can see that the structures give you very, very different uh, results. You don't expect these results, and therefore you have to go back and explain. And the strain energies are also all calculated from this and uh, using certain formulas. And the same thing can be done also for the beta cyclic using with the triple acetyl, I mean, triacetylene. This is no longer two acetylene rings, but three acetylene rings. And therefore, you see a large matrix. Where are these things used for? These are all used basically for uh, such, such structures are very important in the guest and host chemistry and particularly in supramolecular systems. Uh, the size, as the size increases, the cavity inside has specific properties. And then there are what are called the uh, HOMO and the LOMO gaps, which are very favorable for certain uh, reactions to take place inside. Therefore, these systems, as we study them for their stability, have their role as either the host for other chemical reactions to take place because they have large rings with electronic dense, electron density, sufficient electron densities around. Cyclazines are other examples that you can see. Cyclazines are essentially this one. Uh, let me see if you can see it better in any of these. Uh, can you see the cyclooctatetraene in the structure? Yes, sir. This is cyclazine involving three cyclooctatetraenes. Let me see if I can, I cannot rotate these things, but in an animation further down, I'll show you that. This is three uh, cyclooctatetraenes connected to each other to form a total ring. And this is four of them, five of them, six of them, seven. So initially you draw all these structures using a simple molecular drawing program, but then you realize that that's not what you are going to get when you try to find out computationally what their energies are. And when you do quantum chemistry on them and you try to get their energies accurately, you get very surprising results. Okay, cyclosines, for example, by the time you go to a n equal to nine, the planarity is almost lost. Of course, cyclooctatetraene itself is not a planar molecule and therefore, the loss of the planarity of the ring as a whole is not a surprise. But by the time you go to 10, you start getting multiple rings. These are all geometrically optimized to minimize the structures from computational chemistry. And you can see two rings and three rings and multiple rings and so on. So here is an example. You can see how the structure is optimized through this. And what are the intermediate stages by which the structure, this is how we start, okay? When we do the computation, we start from here. The structure, and then the structure is fed into the theory and also to the computer program, and then we try to optimize it, and you see how slowly it evolves to what we call as uh, the optimized structure finally evolves to what you see here, okay? And likewise, you can see that for the optimization for 13 cyclosins, okay? That is, Eight is for the cyclooctatetraene, 13 is for the 13 members which are connected to each other, directly bonded to each other. These are fused cyclooctatetraenes. 816, you can see that it gets into multiple loops. So uh, there is one which also forms a Mobius strip like loop in these things. Therefore, even from the from a theoretician's point of view, of course, there are lots of things which need to be explained. But for a student and for someone who is beginning to examine the quantum chemistry and the computational methods, these systems provide beautiful examples of how to learn the computational chemistry one step at a time by increasing the complexity from one monomer to a dimer, to a trimer, to a tetramer, and then see what are the changes that happen and therefore how we were able to experimentally measure many years ago that a CH average bond energy is 99 kilocalories or 90 kilocalories. Whereas a 
CH bond energy in a C double bond. C is this, how do we arrive at those figures? At that time, a large number of experiments had to be performed. Today, we can perform a large number of computational experiments. And then between one computational result and the next computational result, we can see systemic changes. Therefore, it is possible for us to sit down and write small changes and look for those changes in the results and confirm if these are what we do, what are the experimental values, what, whether this compound can be synthesized, whether this is stable or not, some such predictions can be made with large macrocyclic rates. Okay. So you can see the last one. I think this is 18, 9, oh, I have up to 19, yeah. So you can see 19. These are the number of times that the, it's like the hot fox simulator, you know, optimization. It, the first energy is calculated from the whole molecular system using the basis set. And then the results are used to better the next calculation. And you can see that this whole step goes to about 150 to 200 steps, iterations. And in the end, you get for eight, 19 cyclosine. That is 19 cyclooctetraenes, eight, 19 of them connected directly with each other through a bond. This is what you get. Okay. Oh, I have results also for 20. Okay. So this is the other, let's, uh, let me see if I can stop at this point of time. Here are uh, maybe one or two slides and then I will stop for any questions and other things that you would like to have. Here, the results that we see, I still don't have an explanation. We are studying the systemic uh, uh, behavior of these from published results. Eight N cyclosines till nine, there is no inversion. That is, the rings do not uh, become inverted to each other. But by the time you go to N to 10 and 11, there are more than one inverted cyclooctet train. And there is a triplet state versus singlet states, which are more stable and less stable. And therefore, we have to understand every one of these results, whether they make sense. How do we verify that these are the correct results? We will use multiple basis sets and multiple functionals to see whether the results we get are consistent between them. And once they are consistent, then we have to look for explanations of the behavior as well as the outcome that we get. The, in the case of cyclooctetrain, of course, you can see how these are connected. Here is one cyclooctetrain for eight, six. That is six of them, one, two, three, four, five, six of them connected to uh, each other through the bond. You can see that the reactions that we write down, or this is experimentally known, octaline is experimentally known, Therefore, we have exact, very accurate, experimentally known values for the delta H of these and calculate the comp using computational chemistry, the delta H of the reaction. Therefore, this we can predict from that. So many such results are there and let me not worry about it. What you can see is that graphically, you can see that the heats of formation per monomer actually goes through a dip from N equal to two to three, four, but that itself is very large. That itself is uh, 56 kilocalories per mole. And as you increase, of course, when n is equal to 10, you see that the heats of formation per mole increases. So trends are important. Chemistry is not simply the study of molecules, but we have millions and millions of molecules. Therefore, how can we group these molecules into systems which behave similarly and with small differences, but those differences are very important. Because if hydrogen bonding is a very small difference between two molecules, please remember when you have a million hydrogen bonds, you have the whole DNA. <laughs> okay, therefore the whole structure changes due to small effects, but cooperative effects. Therefore, chemistry is a study of these things from a fundamental point of view: the interactions between the atoms and molecules using computational methods. We don't have a choice on that; we have to use numerical methods these days. But there is a fair amount of algebraic details in terms of building the functionals, in terms of building the integrals, in terms of creating the program. They are all done using algebraic quantities. They are all using algebraic uh, functions like the Gaussian functions. And then the linear combination of the Gaussian functions known as the contracted Gaussian functions. Therefore, it is there. 
The integrals are calculated using numerical methods, but the integral formulas have been put in. So it's a combination of mathematics, numerical methods, and more, most importantly, insight into what we want to study and what theoretical methods are appropriate to use. Okay. So let me see if I have uh, somewhere here. Yeah, this is probably one slide I'd like to show you uh, in terms of what these results were done. Just a second, yeah. You can see that, I think I probably showed you this. Now, this is slightly different from the previous one. You can see that this is the cyclooctatetraene, but now connected to the next cyclooctatetraene using uh, naphthalene, okay? Using naphthalene. This is N, one, two, three, here is three, here is four, and here is five. They're connected between. And you may have that using, yeah, this is naphthalene. I thought it was, okay. Naphthalene is connected, is that link between these cyclosines. You can have a here and see that structure here. And therefore one has to sit down and write the reasonably close chemical equations in order to find out what are all experimentally known on this side. And the homodesmoticity is maintained in all of these things. If you count the number of double bonds and the double bond to single bond connection, double bond, there is no double bond to double bond connection. There is always double bond to single bond connection. And then there is an SP hydrogen, SP2 hydrogen. If you count all of them, they will be exactly the same on both sides and the connectivity will also be the same. And therefore you ensure this by adding a number of species, mass balanced, bond balanced, bond connectivity balanced, and therefore the chemical surroundings are not too far away except for the ring. The ring introduces all the strain. So to calculate that strain, you calculate everything else and see the difference between what you calculate and what is uh, obtained as a difference that gives you the strain energy. Okay. So this is, uh, then you can calculate various angles that I get structural parameters and all those things. Let me not worry about all these. But I would like to summarize the effort in the theoretical chemistry. There are lots of interesting results, even if you choose a very simple system. I mean, nobody would imagine that cyclooctatetraene is all that complicated molecule. Yes, it is. Particularly if you take several of them, and if you bond them with other molecules, you see then the kind of bonding that results and the kind of structures that result. Uh, we have to worry about why are there boats? Why are there rings? And why are they twisted? If you look at all these things, you would see sometimes that the uh, intermolecular bonding, but they are, these are all intramolecular, but the intramolecular bonding characteristics are a new outcome may come out. Therefore, the summary of all of these things is that I have, with the help of the students, I'm trying to learn something better. <laughs> the students do all the work and they come up with all the questions that they don't understand. And therefore, as a teacher, I have to keep telling them, well, I don't know very much, but please proceed. And there was a story which is attributed to Professor Ivan Lee many years ago. I hope uh, Ivan Lee remembers his visit to IIT Madras. I think it's about 24 years ago, 23 years ago. When he gave a lecture to the students, he talked about his uh, uh, development as a scientist. And uh, he recalled that his, his supervisors approach to science was very, very simple. I think the way I remember, it may not be the, the, the most accurate, but I'll still tell you the story. And the, prince, the, the spirit behind the story is much, much more important than the actual details are. The story is that this young man went, uh, not you only, this young man went to study chemistry and his seniors told him that chemistry, if you want to understand, you must also study physics. And then he did physics and chemistry as a major. And then when he went to higher studies, the seniors told him chemistry and physics are not sufficient. By this time, you have to learn a lot more mathematics to understand. So he studied all of that. And then he jumped to the ocean, went to the other side, and his supervisor gave him a problem to whatever it is to study. And after six months, he gave his results to the supervisor. The supervisor told him, well, looks very interesting. Go on. 
And this went on for another three years. Every six months when he gives a presentation, the supervisor would look at it carefully, will give some inputs, but in the end you will say, well, it's very interesting. I don't think I know the answers, but you are going in some direction, please go ahead. And after three years, this professor, this student got very angry. He said, how can I be, you know, I came here after the, all the studies and every time you say is, well, I don't know, it's interesting. I mean, when will I stop doing this? I mean, when will I know what I'm doing is right or wrong? At that point, apparently the supervisor told him that if I knew the results and if I understood that your results made sense, there was nothing new in it. <laughs> then it made sense. Therefore, what is it new? Nothing, nothing new. And if your results were completely unknown to me, I would not know. But what you have done over the period was to connect things. As I said, more and more, you connected more and more things. Now you have really brought this very far, very, very much. Finish your thesis and go. <laughs> so teachers are there largely to drive the students to uh, initiate. Of course, you may help them find a problem, but if the student finds his or her own problem and comes to you, please don't discourage them. The only thing is you should have some expertise in the area in which they want to specialize and you should have read the papers a little bit more than they are able to. And therefore, when they have questions to ask you, you will be able to spend some time. But other than that, if you give the students an Excel sheet or if you give the students a laboratory and say, these are all the instruments I have, any system that you want to study, any of these instruments, if you use, it's fine with me. That's not research. What research is, is the student's ability to go back and search and to understand where the problems come from and then come back to the research, to the teacher, ask for steps to clear, but allow the students to build. But unfortunately in India, we live in a country where uh, publications are extremely important and students compete against publications. So many of my PhD students have been uh, quite angry with me when they were with me in uh, doing PhD saying that I don't help them publish. And I keep telling them, I don't help you to publish, I help you to learn. Publishing is something that you will anyway do in your lifetime. But if you start your life publishing without understanding what you have done, all your life you will still be publishing without understanding why you did what you did. Therefore, the four years or six years or eight years you stay with me, as long as you work well, I will support you financially, it's not a problem. I'll support you intellectually to the extent that I know the problems, I know the solutions, but bring me the problem and bring me the solution. I would say whether these two things match <laughs> and whether they make sense. If you don't write your first paper yourself, you will never write your paper yourself. Therefore, it is important to write the draft yourself, however bad the English may be, however, uh, in, I mean, uh, what do you call, you know, ill-organized you are in your thoughts, still you write them down. And I will tell you, this is a better way of doing things. This is something based on my experience. But if on the other hand, I write your manuscript and give you the tables for you to fill, you will be a scientific clerk all your life, filling tables from the others. Is that what you want to do? Not with me. Please go somewhere else. So it looks like I have only about seven, nine students now, but of the seven students who graduated, I believe five of them are faculty members in various places. In some of them are in the IITs and the others in ICERs and uh, one or two in institutions and the others are in research directions. That's because they were on their own. Our job is to facilitate them. Our job is to help them to learn as teachers. Our job is not to direct them to the research. They are old enough. We, we can guide them on the stage, not on the stage, sitting by the sides. I think this is also a message I would like all of you teachers to keep in mind. Don't worry about if your students are not able to publish five papers or 10 papers or 12 papers. What they are able to publish is what they should understand thoroughly in complete detail and have the confidence that they can solve any problem in any part of the world in any circumstances, having worked with you. I think that's a confidence you should also give. Therefore, in the FDP, Faculty Development Program, this is also a student development that you have to keep in mind. I want to thank all of you for the uh, the, uh, the
permission as well as the invitation that you gave me to speak to all of you. And if there are questions, I'll be very happy to answer as long as I know the answers. Otherwise, I'll direct you to possibly places where you might find the answers. Thank you, Dr. Mallika, and thank you, uh, the Institute, the Ramanujan uh, College, for inviting me to give an impromptu lecture on computational chemistry. Thank you. I'm done. Uh, hi, sir. Um, thank you so much, sir. It was so inspiring to hear you talk about the students, how to deal with research scholars, and reminded me of my days when I was a student. You wouldn't believe yeah. our supervisor, Professor Rita Kakar, is a computational chemist. And yeah. I remember dealing with the molecules, reactants, products, and uh, putting in Gaussian run, yeah. and then not able to understand what it meant when yeah. it, the output came out. So thank you so much. It reminded me of those days. Now, uh, sir, it was so enlightening to hear you talk about how computational chemistry has progressed over the years, how uh, starting from Schrodinger equation, applying various perturbations, variation theorems, how we have come to computational chemistry in the present day and how it is being used for analyzing reactants, products, and studying the reactions. It was uh, inspiring and I hope even uh, my friends from organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry will be able to deal with quantum chemistry in the manner that we physical chemistry, chemists try and deal with it. So thank you so much. It was so inspiring to hear you talk about it. Now uh, I hand over the e-mic to Mamta Sethi. She's my colleague from the college and yeah. she'll be dealing with question and answers on the YouTube channel. Yeah, if they're not, please go ahead. I, I don't know how many I can answer, but I'll try. <laughs> Anto, uh, over to uh, you. Uh, Anshika, are you ready? Thank you. Huh. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, there are some few questions from the participant. So the first question is, what are the application of Schrodinger wave equation? Everywhere. <laughs> All of them. The entire atomic. If you want to know. Okay, let me be precise. Schrodinger equation is not necessary for your and my day-to-day, -day, what we call as the macroscopic cycles or the moons and the, uh, the larger macroscopic phenomena. But if you want to study molecular properties from the point of view of chemists, if you want to understand the geometry of a molecule, the structure, the shape, the size, the interactions between molecules and the formation of condensed phases like solids, liquids and, and any other organized phases if you want to. You need to solve the fundamental microscopic equation and not the classical mechanical equations known as the Newton's equations or uh, Lagrange's equations or Hamilton's equations. These are all classical phenomena addressed to uh, larger macroscopic systems. The Schrodinger equation seems to be the method seems to be applicable to understand the atomic behavior at the electron structure, at the nuclear structure, and so on. Therefore, applications are in every area of science and technology and physics. If you want to know why solids are solids, you cannot understand except by quantum mechanics. Solid, the state itself, you cannot understand it unless you solve the quantum phenomenon. The same way, if you look at the molecular structure, the chemical reactions, bulk of it we can follow. But if you want to understand at the atomic level, what happens? Is it when, when hydrogen atom, hydrogen molecule, when the two hydrogen atoms vibrate very far away from each other, very highly energetic, do they break? Or for example, if in, you, know, you pump energy into a molecule in a certain way, but the molecule fragments into some other way, how does the energy transfer itself from the way in which you've pumped it, the mode into which you pumped and the mode in which the molecule uh, breaks up. So if you want to understand chemical kinetics, if you want to understand chemical transformations at the atomic level, the starting point is the Schrodinger equation. The only thing is it's difficult to solve. Therefore, there are approximations and the approximations pertain to the systems that you study. If it is an ab initio structure that you want to, you must study the electronic configuration around it. You must have some picture about the electron-electron interactions. 
and then solve the Schrodinger equation through the variational minimization principle. If it is a chemical reaction, you start with certain macroscopic parameters, some things that you already know, and then you run the scattering experiment. And through the scattering experiments, you will come to know what are the possible outcomes. If energy is distributed across in a chemical reaction in a transition state, what are all the possible transition states that you can expect and why which transition state leads to which products, that product, etc. If you want to understand that, chemical kinetics, that's what it is. Finally, if you want to know thermodynamics as a parameter, you know, you, thermodynamics is a macroscopic experimental science. All the laws of thermodynamics have very strong foundations in the experimental results for hundreds of years. But if you want to know what is entropy and what is free energy and where is it coming from, or what is the electrochemical energy conversion that comes from, if you want to understand it from the molecular point of view, without the Boltzmann equation connecting the entropy to the number of molecular states, S is equal to KL and omega, that is where omega gives you the number of possible microscopic states. Without that interpretation, it's not possible for you to relate to thermodynamic parameters to molecular quantities. Therefore, and biology, I mean, do we know anything about hydrogen bonding? We know a little bit. And we know enough to redefine the hydrogen bond from what it was 100 years ago when it was first defined. My colleague, Professor Arunan, was the chairman of the uh, IUPA committee to redefine the hydrogen bond and read a new definition was given a few years ago. To that extent, we know, but where it contributes, how does it today, how does the RNA, DNA transfer, I mean, is transfer, all these things take place. If you want to understand them at the atomic, at the more fundamental level, you cannot escape Schrodinger equation. Therefore, it's everywhere. It's also places where you don't need to worry about. I don't need to know what I will do tomorrow based on Schrodinger's equation, because even though the time evolution is an average phenomenon over a period of that whatever it is, I would still characterize it macroscopically. But if I want to know what happens to the a small cell in my body, why it is behaving the way it is behaving, I think I'll have to go back to the atomics. Okay. So don't worry about it. It's as fundamental as one plus one is equal to two that you learn in your high school. Okay. So don't give up. <laughs> okay. So uh, there is one more question. Can we estimate temperature needed to overcome an activation energy barrier? Approximately, yes, based on uh, the uh, Arrhenius. I mean, if you have Arrhenius equation in mind, yes, Arrhenius equation tells you the energy of activation and also the relation of the rate constants to one temperature with the rate constant at another temperature through the exponential of minus Ea by kT. It does, but to a certain extent, you can predict. But please remember, uh, there are reactions which have huge activation energies, but which take place in a very short moment of time because there are enough reactions which have provided it. And once the reaction is on, it generates its own energy, which keeps it going. Therefore, it is not always possible for us to estimate the temperature when a certain reactor uh, will uh, disintegrate or not. But yes, we can calculate. We can make approximate calculations based on the bond energies and uh, based on other parameters. It's possible, but there is no, what is called a clear, yes, it is always possible, I cannot say that. Okay, uh, so next question is, can you suggest a best software for molecular optimization? Best software. <laughs> I use Gaussian, which is a commercial software. There is also Gabus, which is a, uh, very, uh, what is called open software, which you can build component to it. And there is a whole community of uh, experts. It's called the Gamus, G-A-M-E-S-S, -S, Gamus. Uh, and then there are many other professional softwares which will help you solve problems of certain uh, characteristics. But if you want to look at the overarching, that what is called the one which will solve most of the problems, Today, uh, Gaussian, despite being its commercial uh, aspect, it is still able to provide a very large number of uh, inputs for many people without much effort. But if you want to understand things, it is better to move away from Gaussian also and 
put your time with uh, from a software like Gamus, where there is a lot of learning happening simultaneously, and people are willing to teach each other, willing to learn from each other. The open software domain of Gamus is my student has a Gamus code running in my laboratory, and I tell him to do that because Gaussian comes to me as a binary. That is, I don't know what is inside. I only know the labels. If I pull this label, I'll get this result. If I pull this label, I get this result. But I don't know what is inside the label. The programming code is not given to me. In Gamus, I have the entire program source code with me. Therefore, I can change to suit my needs if I understand enough uh, computational processes myself. So I would say in the open software domain, the best one is Gamus. In the commercial software domain, Gaussian is probably the most useful one. Yeah. It's not very expensive, but it's still expensive enough for colleges to have only one or two licenses. Uh, sir, uh, because of a time constraint, yeah. we are going to take one last question. Um, how do we calculate the enthalpy of formation of an ionic species? How do we calculate the? Enthalpy of formation of an ionic species. Enthalpy, is that what? Yes. Enthalpy of? Enthalpy formation of, form of an ionic species. Enthalpy of formation of an ionic species. How do we calculate? Yeah, you can calculate also if the species is in, uh, I mean, if it's a small molecular system, you can calculate thermochemistry, Gaussian thermochemistry allows you to calculate approximately what the enthalpy of formation of the compound is from the atomic energies that we have. So theoretically also it is possible, but if the system is very large, I do not have a specific answer to that question. It might depend on what particular system you are looking at. Ionic systems are slightly harder to calculate than neutral molecular systems because of the additional charges involved and to the electronic densities being uh, localized, more localized. It may be slightly more difficult. I don't have a general answer. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I want to add that uh, YouTube uh, chat box is actually filled with the compliments. Thank you so much, sir, for being Almost a part much. of this faculty yeah. development program. Over you. to you, Malika, ma'am. Okay, I am well, supposed to give you a questionnaire, isn't it? So uh, I have made some questions, some four or five. No, you have made it. I have in my slides at the end of my transparencies, I have some questions. I'll mail it to you tonight, Absolutely. so that you have Thank the you so much, going on for three weeks. I want people to basically look at things that I did not explain, so that they would go back and uh, look at this by themselves. Some of them may already know this, but they can go through that uh, by themselves because I read your. A note saying that uh, the speaker must also prepare a multiple. <laughs> <laughs> no, so that's it's a requirement of the HR, MHRD thing. But yeah. so, uh, I have made some four or five questions, but if you send it to us, it will be. I will send you. I'll send you about eight or nine questions in one slide. Yeah. I'll forward that slide. Okay? Absolutely. Sir. And also, my, so the, the, the presentation I will share with you. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear you speak. And you too. Thank you very much for the time that you have given. And Thank you. I hope I was able to at least get a few people interested to go and look at that. Look yes, at that. Sir. yes sir. I, it was, I'm sure it was. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Have a good day. Have a good weekend and be safe. Yes. And be safe. All of you be safe, 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 safe. That's all we can in Delhi, particularly. <laughs> okay. Stay away from Corona. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I would leave now. Uh, uh, Sir, uh, sir, hame na ek minute ke liye sir YouTube link ek naya generate karna hai. To ek minute lagega na Anshika? Yes, ma'am. Just a minute. Ek minute me YouTube new jan. हो गया क्या